my name is Andre Ferreira. I represent uh, Dixture Consulting uh, from Portugal. Uh, I'm here to talk about the importance of uh, statistical models uh, in anti-money laundering and combating the terrorist financing. And um, so, uh, our guideline for today, uh, I'll be talking about the issue of money laundering and uh, terrorist financing. Um, I'm also going to talk about how to deal with it, um, specifically pointing to uh, the statistical modeling. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about econometrics, uh, being that that's the tool uh, used to build these statistical models. Um, I'm going to compare statistical models to what most companies have nowadays, which is rule-based models. Um, and at the end, I'm going to show you two applications of statistical modeling to uh, AML and CTF. Uh, I'll be showing a risk scoring model uh, for customers, and I'll be showing a transaction monitoring uh, model for transactions. So, um, as you may know, uh, money laundering and terrorist financing is a global growing uh, issue, and it's been concerning everyone around the globe, and especially since uh, the 9-11, where uh, things got a lot, bit, a, a lot more tighter uh, around the, the globe. Um, also, the advancement in technology uh, just opened some doors for more crafty ways of doing it. Um, people have more access to uh, different kinds of, of ways of performing money laundering and terrorist financing. Um, as I just said, uh, the international community is very worried about this issue and is trying to implement as many uh, possible ways to stop it or monitor uh, those issues. Uh, as well as uh, legislations, which have been tighter in most countries, uh, especially countries with, which before didn't have these kind of uh, problems, and now they had a uh, legislation to change uh, just so that they can monitor and catch these kind of situations. <coughs> so, how do we deal uh, with the main uh, problems uh, regarding AML and CTF? Uh, how do we measure the risks? Um, how do we take care of regulations and policies? Um, how do we perform the monitoring and decision making? Um, how do we control uh, the know your customer and know your transaction side of it uh, for financial institutions? And how do we control as well uh, customer due diligences? Uh, the most traditional way to do it is uh, by name checking against some lists which already exist. Uh, but th the issue with that is that we're not finding anything of unknown. So pretty much we're just looking at people uh, which already have already been declared or reported uh, previously, but we're not able to find new people uh, or new transactions in a predictive way. And there's, that's where the statistical modeling comes in. <coughs> so, uh, what is econometrics? Um, basically, econometrics uh, is the application of statistical and mathematical theories uh, in economics for the purpose purposes of find finding future trends uh, and testing different hypotheses. Um, and how does this work uh, in statistical modeling? Uh, basically, we can get a dependent variable, something that we want to explain, in this case, AML and CTF, uh, being, for example, reported cases to, to the authorities, reported transactions, and we can compare them to different kinds of variables uh, and see what their significance is in future cr cases. So we can catch uh, new cases without them happening beforehand, okay? Um, and using this science, uh, this social science, we can build statistical models um, which will help us predict uh, with a certain, certain way and with less false positives, uh, future probably um, default clients and default transactions. Um, a very important subject here is that we use real data for the calculation uh, of these models. So we're not using any test data, we're using real data and each financial institution has a different story inside uh, regarding uh, the, the way the models are built. So the, the data kind of shapes up uh, the final statistical modeling tool, which is going to be used on a daily basis to catch these certain situations. <coughs> so what, what's, what's the main differences between the rule-based models and the statistical models? Well, first of all, in the rule-based model, we're not able to predict the importance of each variable. So we're just putting certain variables there without even knowing which ones are the really, really the ones that matter the most. And on models based in econometrics and statistical modeling, uh, it's the opposite. We know exactly which variables are the most important ones, being that they could change from situation to situation. 
okay? Um, then, rule-based models are mostly constructed ba based on user intuition, where uh, statistical modeling is built under real data and well-established methodologies, um, which can be tested, can be proven, and can be tested on real data and real uh, daily situation. Um, also, uh, models based on rules um, have the, the, the problem which they don't have an underlying method methodology to follow. And on the model, models based on statistics and econometrics, it's, it's the opposite. Uh, we have a certain uh, data set which we, which we use and we know exactly what the, the outcomes is going to be having this data and testing this data as it goes. Um, also, at the end, uh, it is very easy to validate and prove uh, using statistical modeling, uh, where in rule-based situations we get a lot of false positives, in a lot of situations where we don't even need to investigate certain situations, uh, which doesn't really happen on a very well-constructed uh, statistical model. So, I'm going to show you a couple examples. Uh, the first one, I'm going to show you a risk scoring model which could be applied uh, on a financial institution. Um, and so I'm going to show you an example of a model which is built for, for, a cu for customers. Uh, and our dependent variable would be uh, the default situations which already have happened in that financial institution. So for example, reported cases which have happened before. And as independent variables, we could use, for example, for private clients, uh, certain variables like nationality, uh, country of residence, uh, profession, qualifications, and annual income. Um, now, all these variables need to be treated. Uh, by, that, by that said, I mean that nationality, country of residence, for example, we could use lists like GAFI, OFAC, uh, terrorist lists, and apply those to transform the data so that the model could understand better what we're trying to figure it out. Um, on the enterprise side, we could use, for example, the area of economic activity, uh, the society type, also the country of residence. Uh, we could use the, the headquarters uh, place, uh, the age of the enterprise and the social capital of the same enterprise. Okay. Now, as I said, uh, as a dependent variable, we could use, for example, uh, clients which have already been reported or even some insight from the own financial institution, uh, some kind of information or some trouble that worries that financial institution could be used as a dependent variable, which is the variable which we're trying to explain. Um, and with that said, uh, a, a multiple linear regression would be the best way to do this kind of model, a risk scoring model, uh, where we compare that one continuous variable to all the other independent variables and see uh, what parts those independent variables take in each uh, situation. And the good thing here is that some, some of the times we don't even need to use all variables. Maybe certain combinations would be the best way to go, and we'll see that as, as, as long as we keep testing the model and see the results uh, at the end of it. Now, how do we see if uh, the results uh, are complying with what, what, is, what it is expected? So we can see, look, take a look at some statistics. For example, the ARA curve, um, which uh, describes the relation between false positives and true positives. Uh, now, this curve gives us values from 0 to 1. Being that 0, uh, we got too many false positives. 1, we have no false positives. Okay, so the, the, the higher it is, the best. Uh, typically. Uh, we expect something above 90%. Uh, obviously, in a real case, we we'll probably get something like 98%, which will be 0 0.98, uh, and that would be a very positive uh, statistic. Uh, another statistic which we can take a look is the Gini index, and this uh, Gini index uh, tells us pretty much uh, how well the model is predicting uh, the situation which we're trying to describe, uh, in this case, reporting clients. Um, so it also goes from zero to one, being that one, it completely predicts uh, what we're trying to uh, pre uh, find here. Uh, another statistic we could also take a look is uh, the KS statistic, uh, which pretty much describes the distribution between the true positives and the false positives, um, being that it also goes from zero to one, uh, one being uh, the best, zero being the worst. Um, then we have uh, precision, which is very important when you're testing a risk scoring model. Um, in precision, uh, we're looking always at values from 0 to 100%, being that the higher it is, the more precise uh, the model that we're testing is. 
so we, we usually would look at nothing less than 90% uh, for this kind of statistic. And at the end, we have to put a little bit of business uh, judgment here and look at the bad cases which the model returned. So looking at our sample data, uh, see which cases were penalized and why, and see if it makes sense from a business point, point of view before we can accept that model. Now, all these statistics are very important, including the last, the last part where the business side comes in. Um, but to, in order to get a really stable model, we have to perform a lot of testing and combine a lot of variables and see what the best outcome is uh, at the end. Now, uh, like I said, uh, we always have to make sure at the end that it makes sense from the business side uh, um, point of view. Um, and after we're happy with the model that we've built, we have to extract those results and uh, put them in a better understandable risk categorization. For example, the one that I have here uh, from one through five being one low, low risk and five high risk. Uh, so we take the percentages coming from the model and we can apply this uh, these cutoff and see exactly how many clients we have at the end belonging to each class uh, of risk. So, Another way that we can use uh, statistical modeling uh, for, uh, anti for anti money laundering and combating the terrorist financing, uh, and this is a more complex way to do it, but it's the best way uh, to do it as well, would be the behavioral modeling. So what we do, for example, we could build a model which analyzes the client's transactional behavior. Uh, by that said, I mean we, we intend to look at all clients' transactions and find a pattern between those transactions and see if there are any outliers in those uh, transactions between those clients. And how would we do that? So before, we would gather some data, like for example, the average balance of each customer, the maximum and minimum number of transactions per month, uh, the average amount per transaction. Um, we can also get some variables like nationality and profession and such, uh, getting some percentage of international transactions, cash withdrawals, uh, deposits, and many others. Uh, and by getting those uh, variables, what we would do is we would transform the data, uh, applying some quantile normalizations, numeric normalizations, etc., and we would analyze the standard statistics to see if the distribution is well done within those certain variables. What we would do with that, with that data then, uh, by using a methodology which is a self-organizing maps uh, methodology, we could build clusters which are groups of different clients with similarities within them, um, and analyze those clusters to see if they make sense from a uh, point of view. So what do I mean by that is using that data, we build several, several groups, clusters. Uh, and for example, in one cluster, we would have clients with uh, high volume transactions. In a different cluster, we would have clients with no activity or low activity. Uh, some other cluster, we would have uh, clients which perform many international transactions. And what we would do is we would evaluate each cluster and see if it makes sense uh, of the way it was built. And for that process, we can always uh, re uh, re refer to the statistics as well, which have been mentioned in the previous model, um, and make sure that the precision is correct so that we know that the clustering process was well built and we have no uh, false positives uh, with that. <coughs> um, also, at the end of building those clusters, uh, it's always important to make sure that it makes sense from a business uh, point of view. So what we would do is we would analyze the decision tree that puts those clients in each cluster and see if it makes sense overall uh, of the way the, the clients were inserted in each one of those clusters. Um, after we get the stable clusters and the stable groups of clients, uh, we are able then to extract a whole year of transactions uh, within the financial institution and gathering those transactions, we can define which transactions we want to look a little bit more uh, further. Uh, and we can do that by actually meeting with the financial institutions, seeing what, the, what concerns the most uh, those financial institutions, like the operation codes, the amounts, type of transactions. And we can compare that transactional data with the groups already formed and extract a final uh, risk attribution to each cluster using the transactional uh, data as well. Uh, so this process is called the optimization, uh, where we put the transactions and add them to the clusters already formed, optimize the data, and attribute a risk to each cluster, therefore to each client. 
okay? So we would have, uh, for example, 16 clusters, um, each number of clients uh, related to each one of them, and the probability of risk for each of the clusters, being that in this case, using the same scale as previously, one through five, one being low and five being high, we would have the, mo the highest probability with clusters with risk five, which means all of the clients within this cluster would be attributed to high risk, and we would have the lowest probability attributed to risk one, being that every single client in that cluster would have a lower probability of committing uh, money laundering and financing of terrorism. After we define the model, and we have the model ready to uh, be put on, on a daily basis, um, we have to define some thresholds uh, for the clusters and the rules applied in the models. And what does this generate? This generates alerts. And this is the whole goal of building this kind of model. Um, and the alerts that we pretend in this example uh, would be when a client moves from one cluster to the other. So let's say, for example, a client in the last month has had a transactional behavior which is, was not usually his normal pattern. And they, this would generate an alert because this client is moving from one cluster to a different cluster. And we can also apply this to transactions. So if a client performs a transaction which is not usually his or her behavior, uh, then that transaction will generate an alert and that transaction could be investigated furthermore in the process of investigation. Um, the good thing about the behavioral models is that um, this is an outer learning process. So e having this model working on a daily basis allows us to uh, have more data inserted into the model and the model also lear auto learns um, with this new data. So it's always being adjusted uh, on a daily basis, which means that we don't have to have any manual intervenience uh, for this kind of process. Now, going back to the graph which I've showed you before, uh, having these statistical models could help measure the risks, it could help monitor transactions in customers, uh, it could help uh, attribute customer due diligences, which, which means knowing which customers should have a reinforced diligence and which customers should have a simplified di diligence. Uh, it helps on the decision making on a daily basis. Um, it also helps uh, monitoring KYCs and KYTs, being that we have alerts being generated for each one of them. And at the end, it goes with the regulations and policies, which is a main concern nowadays in the international community. So uh, this is my presentation. I'm going to have a little bit of time for uh, questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Everyone's shy. <laughs> <laughs> No questions? <laughs> yes. Uh, actually, it's implemented in three different continents now, um, Asia, Africa, and Europe. Um, and it's been very successful uh, from the past working experience so far. Um, I could name some banks, yes. Uh, Caixa Geral, a group Caixa Geral, for example, uh, is one of the institutions which we, we have. Uh, and many other banks, which I probably prefer not to mention. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, okay. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. <laughs>